The epistle on this 12th Sunday after Pentecost is from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brethren, such is the assurance I have through Christ towards God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. He also it is who has made us fit ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Now if the ministration of death, which is engraved in letters upon stones, was inaugurated in such glory that the children of Israel could not look steadfastly upon the face of Moses on account of the transient glory that shone upon it, shall not the ministration of the Spirit be still more glorious? For if there is glory in the ministration that condemned, much more does the ministration that justifies abound in glory. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. At that time, Jesus said to his disciples, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I say to you, many prophets and kings have desired to see what you see, and they have not seen it. And to hear what you hear, and they have not heard it. And behold, a certain lawyer got up to test him, saying, Master, what must I do to gain eternal life? But he said to him, What is written in the law? How dost thou read? He answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart, with thy whole soul, with thy whole strength, with thy whole mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said to them, Thou hast answered rightly, Do this, and thou shalt live. But he, wishing to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus answered, A certain man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell in with robbers who, after both stripping him and beating him, went their way, leaving him half dead. But as it happened, a certain priest was going down the same way, and when he saw him, he passed by. And likewise, a Levite also, when he was near the place and saw him, passed by. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came upon him, and seeing him was moved with compassion. And he went up to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And setting him on his own beast, he brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more thou spendest, I on my way back will repay thee. Which of these three, in thy opinion, proved himself neighbor to the, him who fell among the robbers? And he said, He who took pity on him. And Jesus said to him, Go and do thou also in like manner. That's the words of the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the intention of this Mass is the worthy intentions of James Sarkis. This is at the request of the Catholic Quiz Bowl of South Carolina. When we look at the Gospel, um, we have a statement that has two parts to it. And um, and in the light of Deuteronomy, which basically says, love God entirely, and Leviticus, which says, love thy neighbor as thyself, the rabbis of Jesus' time had debated the question that the legal scholar uh, raises here, who is my neighbor? The usual answer among the rabbis had been family members only, or fellow Jews only, I think that was the most predominant view. All the countrymen, people who belong to the country 
that is, both the Jews and the resident aliens. So there were definite limits set by all of the teachers of Israel on how far our charity would go, our concern for other people would go. So the legal expert here is not seeking knowledge. He wants to dis start a discussion. I don't know about you, but I've known people from time to time who want, like to have discussions, and that's not bad in itself, or even debates sometimes. Uh, it sharpens the mind in a lot of ways, but it, it's a collegiate type of thing where, you know, when you're grown up and you're settled down, uh, it's sort of annoying. <laughs> and uh, you get into a situation sometimes online too. People ask questions and it's purely academic and you realize they just want to go back and forth, back and forth, seeing if they can win an argument with you. And I don't know about you, but I don't have time for that. Uh, so, but this guy, want, Jesus patiently listens to him. He wants to start a discussion. So Jesus has a man give the answer that he himself already knew. That is the two points from Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Then he asked the rabbinical question, which is what he was really after. Who, uh, who is it? In, who's in the category of those that I must love? And uh, he perhaps, or probably quite likely, was expecting Jesus to include uh, Samaritans or Syrians or all the people that the Jews hated you know, in that, and then he would be able to denounce him for that purpose. But in the, Jesus instead tells a parable. He, he doesn't uh, note one thing here. I missed this point for forever. Uh, Jesus doesn't identify the victim in this parable as a Jew. He totally leaves him unidentified. We have no idea what country uh, or ethnicity he was from because it's not important as Jesus makes the point. The road from Jerusalem went steeply down uh, to Jericho. Jerusalem was so many hundreds of feet above sea level and uh, Jericho is actually so many hundred feet below sea level. And uh, in uh, and the road had, it was kind of rough, and there were loads of robbers all the time. So this is a very believable parable here. Uh, nonetheless, Jericho is also known as a residential city for many of the priests and the Levites. They would take, go up to Jerusalem, take their turn, their weekly duties in the temple, and then they would come back, as these two probably were, when they came. Both of these, uh, both the priest uh, and the Levite would have been familiar with Deuteronomy 22 and Exodus 23, where it sets out that Jews are bound to rescue from peril that even the neighbor's ox or ass. Well, here they have a neighbor himself who's in trouble. Uh, but they go by anyway. They don't see him as a neighbor. Uh, but at the same time, they don't know what ethnicity or nationality he is. So we also, they also knew the rule of ritual purity. A lot of the problem with the, the uh, Pharisees and the, uh, the, the scribes and people like that was they looked on rules about ritual purity, you know, staying unstained uh, as being of equal value with the commandments themselves. And so uh, Jesus, a lot of times if you read his teachings that way, you realize he is preaching a, a lot of times against that very thing. Uh, you know, the purity is one thing, but not at the expense of charity. So the um, they knew those rules out of Leviticus 21, uh, and there's no, um, 
basically it said there's no priest or Levite should make himself unclean by touching a dead or dying person. It's an example I would suggest of Jesus elsewhere saying you strain at, you, uh, strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Uh, you overlook the real importance of the law which is to increase our love. Samaritan it is, it helps the victim. Now the Jews and Samaritans had been bitter enemies, were bitter enemies during Jesus' time. Ethnic and religious grounds, the uh, Samaritans were a conglomeration of Jewish blood and, and the Assyrian uh, captives that had been deported from elsewhere had been moved into Samaria. So they intermingled there, so they weren't quite 100% Jewish, you know, children of Abraham. And also their religion, there were some religious differences, and each side occasionally either tried to or did burn the temple of the other. The uh, Samaritans had a temple at Shiloh, which the Jews did succeed in burning down, and uh, the, the uh, Samaritans tried to burned the big temple in Jerusalem down, but were failed to do it. So, uh, and the fathers of the church see the victim as a symbol of Adam or the entire fallen human race. The Samaritan in that view would be Jesus. And the inn that he takes him to is a church. And so the human race is, is uh, in trouble that way. And then uh, is needing help, needing a savior. Father Gabriel adds to it that the victim in the parable can represent each one of us in our own lives. We have encountered robbers on the way, he says. The world, the devil, and our passions have stripped and wounded us. <clears throat> The Good Samaritan, Jesus Christ, cures the wounds with the oil and the wine of his grace. Oil is, is used as a rep, represents the gentleness of grace, and the wine represents its vigor, its vitality. The end to which he takes us is to the church. As Father Gabriel says, to which he has consigned the price of our ransom, the fruit of his death on the cross. The mass in which we represent that sacrifice where he paid the ransom, the real presence, and all the other sacraments that come with them. So in this parable, Jesus switches in this whole conversation, he switches the point of reference of a neighbor from being the one who should be the object of our charity to being the one who should give the charity, who should be the neighbor. You know, he's, you know, you look at it and you realize he switched that all around. We're called to be neighbor to basically everyone, anyone and everyone, even our enemies, as he says elsewhere. There are several reasons for that. They could be obvious, but I'll go through them anyway. One is we all share the one human nature. Secondly, we're all children of God. We must reverence the image of God that he's put into each one of us, regardless of who it's in. We look at somebody, an enemy or an enemy of our country or something, we say, well, boy, there's no image of God that you can see there, but we're not God. And the image is there, in, at least in the sense that potentially these people could repent and could be converted. As long as they're living and breathing, anyone has that opportunity. And it's not us to ignore their needs, not up to us. And thirdly, all are redeemed by the blood of Christ, and so are at least potentially brothers in him. I say potentially because there are many, as we know, painfully know, uh, who simply refuse Jesus himself. And we are potentially, therefore, sharers in the divine nature. 
all the baptized are members of Christ's mystical body. Uh, everyone else who's not baptized is potentially someone who could be baptized. If some are unwilling to believe in Jesus or to be neighbors to us, we still must be neighbors to them, which is much more important. Better to give than to receive, as the old saying goes. We never affirm sin in these people. We always affirm the person as a child of God who's meant to be saved. Now, there's a lot of really terrible sins that are public now uh, that, are, that are simply uh, cry out to God for vengeance. And uh, they say we are not being charitable to somebody to tell them that they're there, it's all right, God likes you just in the perverse way that you are or the things you do. No, God doesn't like that. He likes who he made you to be and who you could be, who somebody could be. So uh, we, it's, I think it's a sin to affirm other people in a terrible sin. So it means there's a lot of sin around in our public forum nowadays. Because of our love for God and faith in his promises, we have to train ourselves to think well of others, to speak well of others, and to help others in their needs, whether they're spiritual or bodily. Again, not affirming notorious sins of others, but affirming what is good, potential repentance and conversion in them. This is not easy to do, but we must remember that our ransom from which we benefit as believers is meant to be the ransom of everybody who are willing. May God bless you. In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Don't want to forget this. I forgot it last Sunday, and I'll mention it again. Um, as I do remember once in a while, our Scola and our St. Cecilia's Choir have gone, in my opinion, from glory to glory. Now they're assisted with the uh, Blake, the uh, music director here at church, so with a little help from the organ and all to be even better. So. Uh, if uh, uh, if we're if we and what we do are uh, uh, you know making a cake, you might say the the uh, mass. You guys are making the icing, and uh, we can all enjoy it. Lick the bowl, we can enjoy it. It's very wonderful, and I want you all to know that. Um, Okay, a reminder, we have our anniversary celebration, our year and a half anniversary celebration on uh, Sunday, September 4th, coming this coming Sunday after the Mass. It will be an international potluck. Please try to sign up for this by Friday. This will help with decorating for a feast and, uh, you know, putting up sufficient tables and chairs. If you do not know where to sign up or have not gotten the email, please stop by the table in the narthex back there on your way out. And it's very important for next Sunday, uh, both for the Mass and for this celebration afterwards, uh, please park in the back parking lot by 3 p.m. By 3 p.m. Uh, what is it that's going on? There's something else going on. Oh, yeah, there's a wedding going on. It's a little unusual on Sundays, but there is a wedding going on. So, uh, and apparently it's going to be a big one. So let's try to help them out and make, uh, make uh, Our Lady of the Lake even happier that we are here in our parish. God bless you.